Hello? Cool. Um, I'm Nicole Frederick. I'm a covenant member here at The Well. I am a member of the Highland CG, and I also serve as the admin. <laughs> I serve as the admin on the Highland CG. <laughs> um, we'll be reading from Philippians 2 today, 2:25 through 30. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. This is the word of the Lord. All right, all right. Um, hey, let's go ahead and get this out the way. Uh, at the start, last week we had a really huge uh, basketball tournament that Ernest helped set up. That was awesome. <laughs> Uh, my team made it to the championship game and lost by a basket, and I may or may not have gotten a technical foul for yelling at the referees. Uh, but last week, Yusuf told us if we confess, then we will have a revived heart. So revive me, Lord, because I'm still slightly salty at them officials, all right? Um, hey, today we are starting a new short series uh, called Invisible Leaders and looking at some of the lesser known people in the Bible. Uh, after walking through the book of Ezra and then before jumping into the book of Titus, we wanted to spend a couple of weeks actually trying to marry these two series together. Uh, you know, throughout Ezra, there were all these names of people that were read, which y'all did a phenomenal job of reading these names, by the way. Uh, the trick to reading a name that you do not know how to pronounce is read it as if you know how to pronounce it. The random Hebrew scholar is the only person that knows that you're messing up, all right? Um, but all of those names, they, they meant something in uh, the text. Uh, they were important in the building up of the temple of God, the house of God. And I think that oftentimes when we read the Bible, we kind of focus on the big names. And because of this, we feel like what we do for God is not significant. Uh, if we're not the Daniel or the Moses or the Peter or the Ezra, if we are just faithful servants of Yahweh, faithful to our spouse, or faithful in our job, or faithful at UT, or our school, or to our neighbors, or uh, here at the east side, or on Sundays, if we're just faithful in little areas, then we must not be doing much for the kingdom of God. Constantly, however, the scriptures would say the exact opposite. Uh, the Bible is filled with invisible leaders, and they are actually likely the reason that you are here worshiping God today. And so if we're to build the temple of God, last series, or make disciples of God, which is our next series, then we really need the whole body. And seeing how each of us is significant is important for us in building up the church of Christ. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to study some unknown, very rarely named people in the scriptures and to try to glean from them and then from that begin to try to apply what they've done into our lives as well. Today we're looking at Epaphroditus, or Epap was his hood name. Uh, and we're looking at how his sacrificial service really brings glory to God and it brings deep, deep blessing to God's people. Uh, let me ask a question, though, to get our minds around this man as we kind of tee up this series at large. Uh, what would you want said about you on your tombstone? Okay, I ain't trying to kill no one in here today, all right. Uh, but have you ever thought about that, right? Like, like, what words would you want said of you? I know that it's a somewhat common idea, and I've heard that illustration before, but I've never actually thought of it myself until this week. What would you want on your tombstone? And is what you're doing today leading to what you would want written on that tombstone? I think very few of us would want it said of us after we die, he made a bunch of money. That's the tombstone phrase, right? It's like, I mean, he did, but at least he made a lot. Like, I don't think most of us would want us that to be said of us. She was a social media influencer, right? Like, what would you want said on your tombstone? Would you want it to say, meh? 
right? Like, like I know that I would not want to say this, but at times I believe that we live our lives as if he climbed the corporate ladder is what we want on our tombstones. Epaphroditus, though, has been dead for 2,000 years, and yet this letter sort of serves as a tombstone description, and what it says about him is significant, and I believe it's the direction that we should be living our lives. And so let's chop up the text some. Verse 25, you see five specific things about his character and his work. You'll notice the first three is who he was to Paul, and the next two is who he was to the Philippian church. These tombstone words from a guy that most of us have never heard of before are beautifully significant. Quick background on Epaphroditus. He was a co-laborer with Paul. And so he is the one that brought the Philippian letter to the Philippian church. And then he helped bring funds from the Philippian church back to Paul. In the process, he would likely stay and minister to the Philippian church, sort of as an apostolic voice, knowing what Paul would say, and really just try to bless them. Which, if we're honest, that feels like a fairly small thing. It's like, cool, he traveled, brought a letter, and he encouraged people. That's it. That's all that he did. But like Philippians is likely one of the most quoted verses or chap books in the New Testament. Like a lot of y'all love the book of Philippians. I have a verse from Philippians tattooed on my chest. And yet most of us would never even realize that this book existed if it was not for Epaphroditus. Your to live is Christ and to die is gain would not be in your head if the Epaphroditus was not faithful in his mission. If we're honest about these tombstone words, isolated, they don't really seem like much, but when you stop and meditate on them, you realize that this man actually changed the course of church history. Similarly, in our lives, I think when we isolate our sacrificial service, we may not feel like we're giving that much, and yet, if we're honest as we think about our faithfulness, even if we are an invisible leader, only known amongst our close family and close friends, what if that changes the course of church history? Not what if, you are in Christ. And Christ's words, nor his works, do they return void. And so if you are in Christ, then whatever you do for Christ will make impact in the generations ahead of you. Do you realize the significance of your sacrificial service, saints? Notice how East faithfulness, it deeply blessed both parties. Paul calls him a brother. That Greek word brother there literally means from the same womb. And so Paul isn't given like the Southern Baptist, hey, brother, sort of greeting. Right? That's not what he's doing here. He loved this dude. There was relational depth, and we'll see why in a minute, but there's intimacy there between them. Paul also recognized, though, that there was not just relational intimacy to be had, but he was also a worker and a soldier, meaning there was a job to be done and a battle to be fought, darkness to be pushed back, and apparently Epaphrodites was faithful in these things, and this brought great depth to Paul. Notice in verse 27, Epaphroditus was sick. In fact, it says that he almost died, but God saved him. And it says that Paul was overjoyed at that reality because this man is a brother and a co-laborer and a soldier with him in the gospel. In fact, in this exact same letter, Paul tells the Philippians in chapter 4 to do not be anxious about anything, and yet here we see that Epaphroditus' death almost brought this sort of anxiety to Paul in verse 28. And so where in the world did this amount of depth of relationship come from? Well, there tends to be this deep, deep relational connection that occurs when you are on mission together. That makes you feel like a womb sister, a womb brother of the same lineage because you are serving the same father, advancing the same kingdom, pushing back the same darkness, and this is sacred. I wish I had more than one witness this morning, right? It is what Ezra was trying to build, a covenant community that is dedicated towards the same thing. And you and I have a similar mission today, saints. How we sacrifice with and for one another actually creates this bond that at times can extend even past bonds that we have with our family members. 
Because while you may be tied to them by blood, you are tied to one another through the blood of a son. And when we are serving him together, there is something both sacred and eternal about this. There is beauty to be had. And Paul understood this. Paul felt this. And therefore, Epaphroditus' faithfulness and his love for Paul kept Paul encouraged and it kept him motivated for mission. So though you may feel like you are small in the kingdom of God, what if your faithfulness right now is the only reason that your brother or sister that is sitting next to you is still enduring in the faith? What if you're the reason that I have not had sorrow upon sorrow? As Paul says, like, like what if your tombstone word was faithful sister, faithful brother, this invisible leadership that actually impacts generations that can do way more than any amount of fantastic preaching or extravagant evangelism could ever do? I mean, doesn't this sort of sound like God's upside down kingdom anyway, where the last will become first? Right? Like, like we need to recognize that this relational depth, it matters because it maintains us in ministry. And so throughout Ezra, we were asking over and over again, what is it that you are building? What type of temple are you building for God? And when we realize that when we're building something together, it creates this depth of a bond, then we're more likely to maintain stamina in ministry. Now, let's be real. At times, when you're building something for God, it can feel very lonely. We're supposed to be doing this together, though. And that's where the importance of this idea of brotherhood actually comes into play. Deep relationships are formed when we are serving together. Paul is a single man and is experiencing more relational depth than most married people ever do. Because when we serve together, there is something beautiful and significant about that. Have you experienced that sort of covenant community that is one with one another, that as we're trying to advance the mission of God, you're realizing that what you're doing with the co-laborer next to you will echo throughout eternity? There's something significant about that, saints. There's something beautiful about that. Listen, most of y'all know this reality, okay? If you've ever done a short-term mission trip, you know this reality, Because you do a short-term mission trip, and you're gone for like 10 days. And halfway through the mission trip, all of a sudden, because you're serving with the person next to you, they get sick, and you're like, man, I'll die for you, bro. (laughs) Right? You didn't even know this person before you went on the trip. It's like, what is happening? Well, you're supposed to be building something together, and when you're doing it, you feel this depth that is beautiful, This is what the church is supposed to look like, and Epaphroditus, through his faithfulness, is building up the church. There's beauty that's happening here. I feel this, by the way, so many, with so many of y'all. You are so dear to me. There's just too many names to name in a short amount of time. But literally, when Paul says, I have not had sorrow upon sorrow because of Epaphroditus' faithfulness, I have felt that same thing in ministry. Who is it that is co-laboring with you that is important? Well, let's keep it honest. Ministry can be really hard. And do you know what the number one spiritual warfare tactic that is talked about in the New Testament is? The number one thing that the enemy attacks. It's our relational unity. It's why it is in almost every single New Testament letter. Satan is trying to consistently get you to lose this sort of covenantal bond with your brothers or sisters. Ministry is hard. You got a whole devil and your whole flesh and the whole world system out against you. And yet, co-laboring relationships are always worth it. And you need to realize how the enemy is trying to even divide you from that so that you will not endure and the hardship of ministry. We need faithful brothers and sisters that revive our hearts. Ministry is hard, but the relational depth that comes out of ministry when you're co-laboring together, it is worth it, saints. It is worth it. Like this letter does not glamorize ministry. Like Epaphroditus almost died trying to get the word to them. 
Uh, Paul is depressed here, is what the word. In fact, this word is only used one other time in scripture, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But Epaphroditus is about to die, and Paul is depressed. Ministry can be hard. And all of us desire this relational depth. And what I'm saying is, is that sometimes that relational depth is formed in the fiery trials of being on mission together. I think about some of my best friends. I think, I think, I think about one of my best friends, Yusuf Agoro. Uh, Yusuf, who I did not know three years ago, came onto our team. And over the past two years, there's been just a lot of difficulty that has come in my life and in the church at large. And yet Yusuf has been there ministering to me and encouraging me and blessing me and lifting me up and praying for me. And at times ministering to me when I feel weak or at times even ministering for me when I am unable to minister. And all of that ministry together creates this unbelievable depth where I love this brother. He has become like a literal brother to me. In fact, closer than my literal brothers who I don't see as much. There is this depth that can be had in ministry. And so even last week as Yusuf, who was our college director, if you don't know him, as he was preaching, I was sitting there and listening to him. And I was like, I don't know if this man is actually a good preacher or not or if I just really love him. Because I felt like he was spitting. And after I heard y'all, yes, he was, y'all were like, it was really good. I was like, okay, good. It's not just my bias. But I love that man. I had to like think like, do I just think this because of how much I love him? It's like, man, there's this depth that has been created because of the fiery trials of ministry. Once again, <laughs> thank you, dog. I thought you were over there somewhere, but I couldn't see you. All right, so there you go. Um, invisible leader, Epaphroditus. Uh, it could have seemed like what he was doing was small, right? Like he was just trying to get a letter to them, y'all. Uh, that's it. That's so tiny. Like, like what good is it? Is that worth his life just trying to get a letter to a church? Little did he know he was carrying a spirit-inspired, God-breathed soul, scroll that would still be food for you and I today. Like what he was doing mattered even though he likely was not uh, uh, recognizing the depth of what he was doing. So what you are doing, saints, it may feel small, and yet I want to tell you that God sees your faithfulness. When you serve, it creates this bond. And so ministering is hard, but relationships are worth it because you are literally building up the body of Christ that Jesus laid down his life and spilled his blood for. What you're doing matters, saints. It matters to the kingdom of God. And notice, notice, Epaphrodites didn't just have this relational depth with Paul, nor Paul with him. He was the Philippians' messenger and minister is what it goes on to say. Okay, first of all, notice that it says Epaphroditus was the one that was sick, but then he was the one that was also concerned with the Philippian church. I don't know about y'all, but when I'm sick, I turn into a man-child, <laughs> right? Isn't there some phrase like when men get sick, they like turn into babies? What's that phrase? Man sickness or something, I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, it's a real thing. It impacts seven out of 10 men and I'm one of them, all right? <laughs> like I just wanna be cared for and I just wanna be like blessed. I turn into a child. Epaphroditus here is near his deathbed and yet he's concerned about the Philippian church as he's dying because of how much love he had for the church. Saints of God, this man was faithful. He was a good brother to the church as well. In verse 30, it says that he almost died for the Philippian church because of what was lacking in their service to Paul. Uh, this isn't throwing low-key shade, by the way, to the Philippian church, right? It wasn't like, since y'all are some bums, Epaphroditus came on your behalf. That's not what it's saying, okay? They had jobs and homes and businesses, but Epaphroditus was the one that could come to minister to their needs. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 18, Paul ends this letter by saying this. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. But what Epaphroditus was doing here was actually really dangerous. 
You see, in the ancient Near East, you would travel with just a couple of people, but as you went on the roads, it was known that these robbers and these thieves and these bandits would hide out at different places on the road to try to rob wealthy travelers and to ultimately take their funds and kill them. And so Epaphroditus is carrying a bunch of money from the Philippian church to Paul so that he can do ministry somewhere else, risking his his life as he's carrying this money on the streets. Listen, this was before guns, y'all, right? Like, like if somebody wanted to rob and kill this man, it is likely that they could do this. And so Epaphroditus loved this church so much that he was worried about this church when he was sick and he would be willing to risk his life for the sake of mission being advanced. Like, this is unbelievable love, y'all. Yeah. And Paul tells the church, you'll honor men like this. Epaphroditus was necessary for your edification, Philippian church, for my edification from you, like he's the middleman that should be honored. Would you see middleman as a good tombstone word? Everyone's necessary in the kingdom. And if you think that's a sloppy, not a great word for you, maybe you didn't just hear the first half of the sermon, like you have the book of Philippians because of a middleman. This faithfulness is important. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, it says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, when it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Every single part of the body of Christ is necessary if we are to grow into the fullness of Christ. Do you hear that, saints? Yes. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to read a couple of verses here. It says that there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, varieties of service. It's the same Lord. There is a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So to each person is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Right. Now Paul carries out this understanding here. Let's jump down to verse 22. He says this, And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we actually bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable uh, parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. In other words, every single part of the body is significant in the building up of the family of God. You ever sprain your pinky? <laughs> this felt like an unimportant finger. All of a sudden you realize almost everything you do with your hand also involves your pinky. And what feels insignificant feels like, oh, whatever, until you hurt it, and then all of a sudden you can't do half the stuff you want to do. And the same thing is true with us, y'all. When you are sprained, when you take yourself out of ministry, when you don't think you're doing that much because your name is not the Apostle Paul, you can remove yourself from the body of Christ and in so doing hurt the entire body of Christ so that we can't see the fullness of Christ. What you are doing is significant, saints. It is significant. In fact, what Paul says here is that even those parts that feel like they're unable to be presentable, what he's talking about there is our private parts. And what he says there is even though it looks like those don't have a lot of value, we actually know that they're some of the most important parts of the body, and we even show it in such a way by how we protect those parts more than other parts. So even when you feel like what you have to offer is not that presentable in the house of God, I want you to know that God wants to take that and use that for his glory anyway. Yeah. Do you hear that, saints of God? Yeah. Look to your neighbor and say, you are valuable in the kingdom. Good, about half of y'all believe that. Let's keep going. <laughs> You're important, right? More important than you would like to think. Like, once again, think about this man, y'all. Epaphrodites did not come from some strong family lineage. In fact, this name was common in the era, about as common as John is in this era, because it was derived from Epaphrodite. 
the Greek goddess, like the goddess of sex. So his family likely worshipped this Greek god, meaning, side note, if you have a messy past, if you are a believer in Jesus today, no matter what the legacy is that is behind you, you now have the Holy Spirit inside of you so that the legacy, the tombstone words in front of you can be brother or soldier or minister or worker of the gospel. Do not let your past disqualify you. That's demon talk rather than gospel talk. God wants to bring redemption to your life, saints. Listen, Epaphroditus was necessary for the gospel despite us never even knowing this man's name until this morning, right? He's the reason you have this letter. He was an encouragement to Paul. He was an encouragement to the church and now to us because of his sacrificial service. And so serving Jesus is hard, but saints of God, eternal fruit is worth it. If you recognize what you are building for eternity, you will be more likely to endure the hardship of ministry today. Which to that lesser members of the body idea, this is important. We got to remember that eternal fruit is important because Epaphroditus was a human. And I'm sure at times he felt like, yo, I almost died for this, yo. Like, is it really this serious? And he may have felt like a lesser member. Is it worth it? And if he's just serving... For an earthly reward, the answer is no. It's not worth it. Like, let's keep it real, y'all. If building up the church of God is just for an earthly reward, it's really not worth it. It's difficult, and people are messy, and it's hard, and you can get hurt and wounded. But if Jesus is real, like, if the Lord is true, you do know that you're going to live forever, right? Like, like that this earth is not your home. Your faithfulness does indeed ring throughout the halls of eternity. Can you see it, saints? Can you see it? Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, the latter half of that verse, I love this. It says, your father who sees in secret, he'll reward you. And so you may not have known Epaphroditus' name before today. That's okay. God did. And God rewarded this man. And so even if you do not get the spotlight here on earth, God sees it and will honor you with his glorious light in heaven. In fact, it is better there for their honor and rewards do not fade or do not crumble. And so don't seek the applause of man that fades as fast as that sound goes away. But seek the well done from the Father because that lasts for eternity, saints. That lasts for eternity. That's what God is calling us into. And ultimately, saints of Christ, while Epaphroditus should inspire us to faithfully serve, that we may have these deep relationships, that we may bear eternal fruit, Epaphroditus is only a pointer to the true and better brother, the true and better fellow worker, the fellow soldier, a better messenger, and a better minister, Jesus. And so ministry is hard, but saints of God... Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. You see, Epaphroditus was sacrificially obedient to the point of death. But Jesus was actually obedient to death. While Epaphroditus almost died for the work of ministry, Jesus did die for the work of ministry. Epaphroditus brought this letter of Philippians to the church in Philippi, but Jesus brought the word of God. Jesus was himself the very word of God and brought it down here to earth and not just gave a letter to a church, but established the church of Christ until he returns. I said earlier, that Greek word, full of heaviness, that Paul uses... It's only used one other time in Scripture. Paul feels this heaviness, but in Mark chapter 14, verse 33, as Jesus is about to go to the cross, it says he took Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. That's the word again. And so while Paul would feel full of heaviness, Jesus would actually become this heaviness. You see, Jesus was perfect. He was never ill. And yet he would wrap himself in flesh, come down to earth, and become so ill with sin, not just to the point of death, but would actually die on the cross. And as our sin was being placed upon Jesus, this sinless son that should have never received any amount of suffering went to the cross and died for us. And so is ministry hard? Yes, and yet Jesus would answer, you are worth it. That he desires relationship with you. That Jesus would do whatever it takes to build up the church, to be a faithful minister and a brother to you. And the gospel, Jesus is the better Epaphroditus. 
And as we see that, and as we believe that, verse 29, then we should receive Jesus with all joy. And upon receiving him, should we just keep this joy and hoard it to ourselves? No. Verse 28 is where I want to go, which will transition us into an important moment for our church today. And it's really a corporate application in a letter like this. Think about how easy it would have been for Paul just to keep Epaphroditus. He finally got the man he loves back, right? But no, he was healed, and now Paul wants to send him back that he might be a further blessing again. Paul knows he's going to get this man in eternity. He knows that the kingdom of God is worth it. Paul wanted to send him that they might serve this church well. And so an immediate application for us in the midst of this gospel message is that what we are doing, whether big or small, whether we feel like we're known like Paul or feel like we're unknown like Epaphroditus, our faithfulness matters to the kingdom of God. And as we do faithful things, it is important that we recognize what we do echoes throughout eternity.